everyone, I hope you're all having a lovely day today. I literally had to like look back through my past like handful of videos because I was convinced that I'd worn this like for every single one, but I wore it two weeks ago. I'm sure you can forgive me. Don't really have much to tell you this week in the intro. Usually I do a bit of babbling. Just the usual that if you haven't already subscribed to this channel and you want to see more videos from me, then please do because I'm trying to hit 1,000 subscribers and it'd be great if I could hit that. But if I could hit that by the end of the year, that would be amazing. So I'm gonna get straight into the case. Get it, your cup is ready. I've literally just nearly poured this all over my legs. That would have been fabulous. So this is the case of Sarah Payne. And if you are around my age and you live in the UK especially, you'll remember her picture so, so well. I definitely do. I was about six when this happened. And yeah, I just, I kind of remember like me, mum and dad telling me a little bit about it. Obviously they didn't go into too much detail. I think after, what happened to Sarah Payne happened. Everyone's mum and dad kind of give them the talk about, you know, being wary of strangers and things. And it's a really heartbreaking case. Obviously this case is gonna talk about like the death of a child, um, sexual assault. So please, um, you know, click off if you don't wanna to listen to that kind of thing. Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne was born on the 13th of October in 1992 and she was the third of four children. So she had two older brothers, Lee and Luke, and then she had a younger sister called Charlotte. Her mum and dad were Sarah and Mike. So we've got Sarah who is Sarah's mum and Sarah who is the daughter. Just saying that so no one gets confused. Um, yeah, there's a Sarah and there is a Sarah. Sarah described their family as a mad, messy and noisy family. She said that when they argued, it was big and it was crazy, but when they were all happy and they were playing and they were laughing, it was also being crazy. So um, yeah, with four kids, you can imagine the kind of energy that that family had. Obviously they'd had two boys before, so with Sarah being the first girl, she was bought lots of you know pink stuff by the grandparents, lots of frilly things, and she loved it. She absolutely loved you know pixies, princesses. Her siblings say that she loved to dress up. She loved to sing, even though apparently she was awful. There's a few interviews with the siblings and it's just lovely to see them talk about her and remember her like that. So on July the 1st in the year 2000, Sarah was eight years old at this time. Her younger sister Charlotte was six and her two older brothers were 11 and 13 at the time. On a Saturday, Sarah, Sarah's mum, worked at a pub and she'd take Sarah and Charlotte with her. They loved to play in the big garden that was at the pub and they went with her every single week. But the boys stayed at home with Mike who was their dad and Mike worked nights so he was sleeping off his night shift. So he was asleep, the boys were home and Sarah, Elizabeth and Sarah were all at the pub. As a family, they didn't really have any other plans that weekend, so they decided to go and visit Mike's parents, Les and Terry. They lived in West Sussex and they were really close to Kingston Gorse Beach. It was literally about a two minute walk away from the house. They'd been in the past, they used to go up for weekends. I think they might have stayed the night on the Saturday and, you know, woke up Sunday and spent time together and then gone home the next day. I think Sarah said in an interview that she hadn't actually been there for a while and they just decided that it would be a lovely day to go. It was the 1st of July, it was really hot. So they all wanted to go and visit their grandparents. So when they got there, Les and Terry had dinner ready for them all. So they were all just sat around eating dinner. And then while the adults cleaned up, the kids played outside. When that was all finished, they all went for a walk along the beach. The kids were playing and skimming stones. They were all just having a laugh and having a really good time together. So as they were all playing, the grown-ups wanted to go and see a house that was apparently being done up. And obviously that's quite boring for kids to go and look at. So the kids asked if they could stay around the beach and stay and play out. And you know, just be around the general area together. So the grown up said, yeah, that that was fine, but they had to listen to the oldest brother who was 13. They had to do whatever he said. And obviously there was four of them. So they thought that this would be absolutely fine. And with it being so close to their grandparents' house, it was pretty much the back garden. So the adults stayed with the kids for a little bit longer, skimming stones along the beach. And then they went to go and see this house. They stopped off at a pub for literally a half a beer. They said they stayed for about 15 minutes and then they came out and went back to the house. Meanwhile, the kids had walked back up the lane to a field that was right behind their nan and granddad's house. It was a cornfield and it was the perfect place to play hide and seek and to run about in. So while the kids were playing in the field, Sarah fell and apparently cut her knee and she wanted to go back to her nans. You know, she got a bit moody and annoyed. Um, apparently the younger of the two brothers was being a bit mean to her. Um, 
and told her to F off and go home, which is really sad to watch in an interview. He's so distraught that they were his last words to Sarah. But it's just kids being kids. Like how often when you were little did you just say something horrible for the sake of it? It makes me sad like to see him so upset. From what happened to Sarah as well, I remember, you know, being little and being like, no, I'm gonna go home. No, no, I'm gonna go. And I can imagine what she was like at that point when she'd hurt her knee and just wants to go back to her nans. So Sarah apparently went round the outside of the field and her brother Lee, who was the oldest, who you know knew that Sarah was his responsibility but she was kind of storming off, went straight after her and he'd turn around you know once or twice just to check that Luke and Charlotte were okay, turned around, looked at them, carried on going towards Sarah. He was just you know seconds behind her. Sarah had gone through a little gap in the hedge that led to their nan's house and Lee was just as I said seconds behind her but when he came out the other end Sarah wasn't there. Lee obviously thought that she'd just been you know quick at walking and was at the grandparents house so he carried on went to the grandparents house but when he went in and said is Sarah here the grandparents said no. Sarah said that when they got back to the grandparents' house, Les was standing outside holding Charlotte's hand really tightly and just saying, is Sarah with you? And obviously she wasn't. Sarah said, no, she was with the boys. That's where we last saw her. So obviously they were panicked. I think a part of them thought that she may just be playing a joke. Maybe she was, you know, in a huff. She was hiding, she was sulking. So they started looking around for her and shouting her name. Sarah went down the main roads with Charlotte to look for her and Mike went across the field. Terry, her granddad, went down to the beach and Les, her nan, stayed at home just in case she wandered back. And Sarah mentions that Sarah was a really shy kid, like she wouldn't have um, hid and, you know, thought it was a really good trick to, you know, make everyone scared. She just wouldn't have done that. She couldn't play hide and seek for more than two minutes. When they couldn't find her in the media area, Sarah decided to go and have a drive round. And when they drove into the village, she said that she saw a little girl playing with two boys and she pulled up because she looked exactly like Sarah. But then the mum came out and was obviously like, what are you doing pulling up trying to speak to me kids? And Sarah just said, I've lost my daughter. And the mum said, what does she look like? And she said, she looks just like yours. I can't imagine how heartbreaking that is for that second to have thought that she was there must have been so horrible for Sarah. As the family were passing people, they were asking if anyone had seen her, but they hadn't. But luckily, a few people were happy to help them look because they knew and saw how worried that the family were getting. But after Sarah had been missing for an hour and three quarters, they decided that they needed extra help at this point. It wasn't looking like she was anywhere close. So at quarter to nine, Sarah made a phone call to the police to report Sarah missing. Almost immediately, Sussex police were moved from their usual Saturday night duties to come and help with this case. And within 15 minutes, the police were on the scene. So the police got the family together and asked from everyone's point of view what had happened, just so they could try and piece together where she could have gone. They also started thoroughly searching the immediate area around the home, just in case she'd fallen in a hole or a ditch or she was stuck somewhere. Within two hours, there was over 100 police officers looking for Sarah. It became a high priority incident almost immediately because in most abduction cases, you've got about six hours before the victim is usually killed. So this was a really stressful situation to try and find her and to bring her back. Back at the house there were police searching around it as well in cupboards and cabinets and just places around the house and I think the family were a little bit um, not annoyed but just kind of like why are you wasting time looking around here because obviously from the family's point of view they know what happened and it must be annoying to be like why are you searching in here when you should be searching out there and um, there were police officers searching outside but obviously you know what I mean, it must be annoying to be wasting time looking inside, but from the police's point of view, they need to rule out everyone in the family and make sure that nothing horrible happened and the family are like, oh, she's missing, which obviously has happened before. But they didn't find anything in the family home and carried on their searches outdoors. At this point, Sarah's older brother Lee pulled their mum to one side and Lee was the one who was right behind Sarah when she'd gone missing. and. He said, like, Mum, I think I uh, saw something, but I don't know if it's important, I don't know if it's relevant. And she just said, well, whatever you saw, you need to tell the police because they'll decide if it's important to use or not. So he spoke to police and he said that when Sarah had gone through the hedge and he was close behind, he actually saw a white van go past him. 
he said that the van's wheels were squeaky and skiddy and the man inside the van had smiled and like waved at him to thank him for letting him past. Lee said that the man was quite scruffy looking like he hadn't shaved for ages. He said he was greasy looking with white bits of stubble on his face. He had yellow teeth when he grinned and his eyes were like really really white and stood out from his face. And at this moment this was the only lead that the police had. Sarah had been to her grandparents before and she played out there before but it wasn't her own area, she didn't know it, you know, like the back of her hand. So up until now they kind of hoped that maybe she was just lost but now because of this site and it was looking more like an abduction. So because of this they started looking at their databases into local sex offenders to see if anyone was around the area at that time. The search for Sarah continued overnight but there was no evidence and no sign of her. So the day after Sarah disappeared the police decided to pay a local paedophile called Roy Whiting a visit. They knew that he lived close and obviously he was on the sex offenders register so they wanted to check him out and see if he had an alibi or if he knew anything about where Sarah had gone. He was immediately a person of interest, but the only thing was is that he wasn't known to have a white van. But when the police were sat outside his address waiting for him to return home, he drives up in a white van that he'd just bought from South Upton. They interviewed Roy, but he said that he'd been at a fun fair miles from where Sarah was abducted. He wasn't really helpful at all, he just said that he wasn't around there at all, but his demeanour was apparently really suspicious and really worried the people who were interviewing him. So they couldn't really do anything with him at this point, you know, there was no evidence to connect to him, there was nothing to say that he was in that area yet, so there was nothing they could do. They just got out and went and sat in their car, but as they spoke they were talking about how suspicious he seemed and that they didn't like it, so they were going to keep an eye on him. And literally minutes later, Roy comes out of his house and opens the van door. When he opened it, a receipt fell out. And obviously immediately the officers got out of the car and went and picked the receipt up. And it was a receipt for petrol. It was dated the day that Sarah went missing and it placed him miles away from where he said he was at this fun fair. Roy was properly taken in for questioning but he just kept saying no comment, they couldn't get anything out of him. They were able to search his van though and they found a lot of worrying things in there. There were cable ties strung together so they made kind of handcuffs, like a restraint so that you could tie wrists or legs together. There was a condom, there was ropes, there was knives, there was baby oil, there were sweets, chocolate. It was, it was horrible. It was like an abduction kit basically. But there was nothing of Sarah's that could be found in the van. The day after, Sarah's parents went on television for the first time to make an appeal. They said we're a strong family and we don't survive well apart. And Sarah would address Sarah and say that we're looking for you, you know, we can't wait for you to come home. It's just really heartbreaking. But Sarah was so confident that they were going to find Sarah and it's crazy how strong she was. I don't know how she did it. I'm not a mum so I can only like half imagine the amount of heartbreak that she must have been feeling. Uh, it's crazy but she was just so strong through it all and then with the appeal went up the picture that i think everyone remembers of her in a school uniform roy's flat was being searched during this time and he was just repeatedly being interviewed they only had him in custody for about 48 hours which is all they're allowed to do and they couldn't find anything to link him to sarah whatsoever so unfortunately after 48 hours they had to let him go there was also another man who was taken in the Crawley area but again they couldn't find anything on him so after the custody time he was let go as well. The police were looking for any disturbed earth within like a 20 mile radius and they were still all out looking for Sarah. By this point there was about 1000 police officers looking for her. They were doing underwater searches, there was helicopters, everything that you could imagine they were looking for her everywhere they could think of. They were still eliminating sex offences at this point and the first like 10 had been done ages ago, they were up to hundreds, just eliminating them to make sure that they had nothing to do with the disappearance. Their brothers were making appeals on television as well and the media were trying to take a lot of pictures of the family and a lot of videos just to try and get people to come forward to be like, you know, this is a real family that's been pulled apart by this, please help them come forward with any information. And there were people who came forward with information and sightings but none of them could really be confirmed. The family liaison officer was telling Sarah to get you know her bag ready for Sarah for if they did find her just to take the things straight to her and just trying to you know discuss the possibilities of every way she could be found. 
On July the 17th, just over three weeks since Sarah went missing, the family liaison officer came round to the house. Sarah was in with a couple of the kids, but Mike was out. And she said that she could tell that he was awkward and he needed to tell her something, but she just kept putting it off. She knew that it was bad news in a way, just by the way she, he was acting, but she didn't want that news to come. She just kept trying to, you know, not make the moment come. And the story came up on the news around the same time as the family were told that a body had been found. Sarah's body was found by a farm labourer called Luke Coleman. She was near Pulborough, around 15 miles from Littlehampton. He was clearing weeds from a field that was going to be used for horses and he saw what he thought was a dead animal. He thought it was a deer. He said it was lying long ways parallel to the hedge. It didn't appear to have any hair on the head and he could tell from the smell that the body was decomposing. There's more detail online, I don't want to go into more detail than that, um, just because it is really, really upsetting. So she was 15 miles from where she'd gone missing, but only three miles from where the petrol receipt was from. Just to sum it up, as I said, there's more detail online, but I don't want to reel it all off here. Um, she was found naked, so obviously that's horrible. There was no evidence of sexual assault that they could see, but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And also, she was found naked. Sarah's cause of death was said to be asphyxiation. The grave was thought to be dug really shortly after she'd passed away, so the killer just wanted to get it over and done with. Obviously, in murder cases, they can never go, oh, we've found a body and it's definitely this person. They have to do tests on it and have it identified. And they did the test, they identified it as Sarah, but Sarah's brothers were saying, well, how do we know? It's definitely her unless you go and identify it to their mum. And she really wanted to, she wanted to make sure just to be like, there's that tiny bit of hope that it's not my daughter and the tests are wrong basically. And she thought that it was her kind of duty to her kids to go and make sure that it was her and she could pass that news on to the kids itself. They agreed that Mike would go and see Sarah and describe it to Sarah. Then Sarah would decide if she wanted to go and see Sarah or not, but it was apparently just far too upsetting and Mike came back just um, a ghost of a man of how it described. So Sarah was just like, no, I don't want to see her like that. And the people who had been, you know, working with Sarah's body said that it was a good idea that Sarah didn't go and see her like that either. So again, there wasn't any forensic evidence on Sarah to link her to Roy or to anyone. All they had was the receipt and the sighting of the man from Sarah's brother. On August the 31st, Sarah's funeral took place at St. Peter's Church in Hersham, just yards from her former school, which was Bear Hill Primary School. They had a brass statue honouring Sarah, which was installed in 2002. So because the police were so suspicious of Roy, Roy actually went and moved back in with his dad, who lived in Crawley. But there were rumours surrounding Roy because he was quite known. People knew that he was weird, that he, you know, hung around kids, and they started attacking his dad's house. So Roy took himself to camp in a tent near an estate in Crawley. Roy William Whiting was born on January the 26th in 1959 in Horsham in West Sussex, but he grew up in Crawley. He was one of six kids and three unfortunately died in infancy. And his mum and dad, George and Pamela, divorced when he was in his teens. He didn't have a great relationship with his parents, he didn't do great in school, and he was known as a loner or as a Billy No Mates, as they called him. As an adult, he became really interested in cars and started working at a garage. He also married a lady who was an assistant at a petrol station. They married and had a baby, but they divorced shortly after in 1986. In 1990, he was 31 and he started developing a horrible obsession with young girls. Neighbours said he'd go out and he'd linger around schools around the time that they let the kids out and he'd be driving around in his van, kind of eyeing everyone up. And at 36, on March the 4th in 1995, he actually abducted a young girl. He just took her off the streets, took her to a wooded area, sexually assaulted her and then dropped her back off at home. And he sold his car to avoid being caught, but it was eventually tracked down. In June 1995, he got only four years for this abduction and assault of this nine-year-old girl. 
Before the trial, he was assessed by a psychologist who said that this was a one-off, that he wasn't a paedophile, he wasn't gonna attack again, but then he was assessed a second time and the psychiatrist said that he would probably most definitely attack again, that he was obsessed with young girls. He only served two and a half years of this sentence and by 1997, he was just out again. He moved to Littlehampton, which is a seaside town, which is full of families and he was just he was just there trying to blend in carrying on as usual and after Sarah's abduction the place where he was camping was actually right near the estate where he'd abducted the little girl in 1995. So Roy was being watched and since Sarah's body had been found he was panicking he ended up stealing a car and driving it like the wrong way down the street bashing it into parked cars and then trying to ram a police car out the way that was chasing him. He was sentenced to 22 months for this incident but they didn't have any evidence still to connect him to Sarah's murder until Sarah's shoe was found. Police got a 999 call from a lady who said that she'd seen a shoe a few times going up and down this road and she hadn't thought anything about it, but she decided that it was time to report it. Obviously you see shoes all the time being lost, you know, from kids and you kind of just think they've lost it or someone's taken it as a joke and like thrown it. I think she passed it for a few days and then said, you know, I better ring up about this. The police went to get the shoe, which was located near the tiny village of Coolum, less than four miles from where the body was discovered. And it was located between where Sarah's body was found and the petrol station that the receipt was from. Sarah was able to confirm that it was Sarah's shoe and it was a Velcro shoe as well. And Velcro is obviously amazing for picking up any kind of fibers. They were able to find fibers from Sarah's jumper on there so they could you know 100% confirm that it was Sarah's and during this time they were also deep searching that van of Roy's. They were able to find fibres from Roy's sweatshirt in the shoe too. He had a red sweatshirt and it also had one of Sarah's hairs on it, just one single hair and they were able to link him to the murder. Finally. Roy Whiting was formally charged with the murder of Sarah Payne. On November the 13th, Roy went on trial in Lou's Crown Court. The jury heard evidence from witnesses including Sarah's oldest brother Lee, who'd seen him. Luckily, because of that one single hair, Roy was found guilty of Sarah's murder and he was sentenced to life. Only after he was found guilty were his previous convictions able to be read out in front of the jury. Before that, they had no idea that he'd abducted that nine-year-old girl all those years ago. I don't understand why. It really winds me up as you can probably tell because my voice is shaking and i'm getting annoyed um but yeah it, that wasn't allowed in the court in case it harmed his defense <sighs> so he was jailed for life with a minimum of 50 years but he appealed and got that reduced somehow to 40 years so when he's in his 90s i can't even speak properly i'm saying 90s when he's in his 90s he will be eligible for parole <sighs> I'm just gonna read this straight from the page so I'll get the information right. Um, I won't go too into it, but I'll leave a link to it in the description. It prompted one of the biggest changes that has happened since Sarah's death, Sarah's Law. Michael and Sarah Payne began a campaign in conjunction with News of the World for a change in the law that would give parents the right to know about local sex offenders living in the area. In 2011, 11 years after they began, Sarah's Law was rolled out across England and Wales. So if you want to read more about that, I will put it in the description below. In the aftermath of Sarah's death in 2003, Sarah and Mike unfortunately separated. Mike was said to be absolutely destroyed by her murder. He was never the same. Sarah had a stroke as well, which causes her a lot of trouble walking now. And Sarah's dad, Michael, actually died from alcohol abuse in 2014. He was just 45 years old. So that is the case. As I said, it's upsetting. I'm really angry if you can't tell I'm like <laughs> I don't know I get really um yeah stuff like that where it just doesn't make sense I'm like this <laughs> you know, stuff like that where it just doesn't make sense like why on earth would you keep that information from a jury I don't know like I, I, I get it in the terms of like your defense and <sighs> like I get what they're trying to do but it shouldn't be allowed like it just winds me up so I'm going to keep this short and sweet before I kick something over. Um, I am thinking of all of Sarah's family. It's so upsetting and it's strange to have grown up with this case, like kind of half knowing about it, but now to fully look into it. It's horrible to kind of have found out 
everything. Absolutely insane. Um, and I'm so sad that this one man just took it upon himself to wreck this family, to put it just in the simplest way. So thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you thought about this case down below. Please like and subscribe, all the good stuff. Click the notification bell so you know when I have uploaded. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram if you haven't already because it's lovely to have people over there as well. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next one and I promise to try and not be as angry next time.